You know, that's Aye. the question for you. I mean, for everybody who's out there, it might be... Because they have chopsticks. No. They are more sophisticated. No. Uh, they are more intelligent. No. Okay, no. Because these two fingers belong to me. <laughs> All right, I think. Okay. That was a simple answer for okay. that as well. I concede I'm not smart. Okay, that's <laughs> just fine. On, just on a lighter note. Okay. But uh, what are we talking about today, Haja? It's an important day for us. Yes, yes. So we are going to talk about the COP28 conference, which is going to be held in Dubai. And it's a very important conference, considering the fact that Pakistan is the country that is worst hit by the climate change. Uh, and, this, and we have been saying it again and again. And this is also our state narrative, I think last year we discussed it uh, in detail uh, when the COP27 conference was held in Sharmul Sheikh that Pakistan is the victim of something which has been the doing of the West, a more industrialized nation, uh, which are the carbon emitters and which has created such a situation, uh, the environment de degradation in particular, that the countries in the third, global south in the third world, the countries like Pakistan, they are suffering the brunt of all of this industrialization. So this industrialization, this modernization should be more uh, sustainable in a manner that the countries like Pakistan should not be bearing the brunt of that. And uh, that is why last year loss and damage fund was established. Uh, world committed $100 billion, but b there's a vast difference between commitment and between making sure that we walk the talk on that fund. And, um, and it is also going to be uh, focusing on the climate action, climate financing, because last year, Shahzad, we suffered $40 billion of losses, losses exactly. climate losses in particular. Exactly. Because and the reason being is that because Pakistan actually yes. falls into the category of high risk towards climate change as True. well. So this is something that we've actually experienced over here in the country. Right. But to kind of talk more about it, I think what we really need to do is that we really need to have experts over here True. who you know, by themselves are making sure that they're going True. to bring about that change as much as they can. So ladies True. and gentlemen, first up, we're very lucky that we've actually been joined by the Chief Executive Officer of Pakistan Environment Trust and he happens to be Mr. Talha Khan. Mr. Talha, can we please have you over here? Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Alaikum Thank shazad. you so much for joining nice us. Please, over here. And uh, joining him, ladies and gentlemen, his partner obviously happens to be the Program Director at Pakistan Environment Trust. He happens to be Mr. Hassan Anwar. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum Good assalam. morning. Thank you so much Thank for joining well. us. Thank you. Please come over here. And meanwhile, I just want to clarify, partner at work. Yeah, <laughs> partner at work. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I know that we're in English, but we're not in the Western country, okay? <laughs> so, for everybody who's out there, for you to better understand yes. what COP is all about, I think you really need to go ahead and take a good look at this package. Go ahead, and we will continue with the conversation. Let's do it. It's from nearly 200 countries, leaders of business and finance, and representatives of civil society will gather in Dubai from November 30th to December 12th 
for the COP28 climate conference with the aim of fast-tracking the transition to a clean energy future. Conference of the parties, referring to signatories of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, an agreement signed by over 150 governments in 1992. COP28 is the 28th annual summit, bringing their representatives together to seek agreement on goals and strategies to address the climate crisis. Climate change refers to long-term shifts in temperatures and weather patterns. Such shifts can be natural due to changes in the sun's activity or large volcanic eruptions. But since the 1800s, human activities have been the main driver of climate change, primarily due to the burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas. Burning fossil fuels generates greenhouse gas emissions that act like a blanket wrapped around the earth, trapping the sun's heat and raising temperatures. Despite being a low carbon emitter, Pakistan ranks high in the Global Climate Risk Index and needs climate finance to adapt and mitigate to climate emergencies, for example floods. Pakistan had a strong representation at COP27 last year and led the developing countries' bloc rallying for the loss and damage fund. In accordance with the Paris Climate Accord, Pakistan has set nationally determined contributions committing to abate overall 50% of the Pakistan's projected greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Pakistan will showcase its climate resilient projects at the upcoming UN Climate Summit COP28 to be held in Dubai. This was stated by Secretary Climate Change Asif Haider Shah at a news conference in Islamabad. The secretary said that we will have engaging panel discussions at this event on all critical issues. He said we will also highlight our Recharge Pakistan and Living Indus initiatives. Asif Haider Shah said the world community needs to fulfill their commitments to effectively deal with the issue of climate change. Delegates from... Right, and uh, obviously uh, energy transition and climate financing, climate action are the two of the most important agenda agendas that are going to uh, top the list of the countries, especially in the COP28 conference, and we are going to talk more about it because energy transition is, a, I think it's an elephant in the room and uh, we need to talk more about it, but it requires a massive change in our lifestyles and are we ready to do that? This is the question that we would throw at our guests. So, um, Talha, so please, we'll start with you. Uh, you. You see that there's a conference going on in COP28 um, and if we talk about the energy transition, do you think that the world leaders can agree with that transition because it's a very, uh, I, I would say, a fragile sort of a concept, right? Yes. Uh, I mean, first of all, thank you so much for having us here. It's a great, I mean, you introduce us as the experts, but all of us are students of this topic because it's such a complex topic to solve anyways. Uh, Haja, going to your question specifically on energy transition, uh, conceptually, everyone agrees on it. It's a topic that nobody can debate that it's wrong or we shouldn't do it and any, any of that. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, it's, uh, the devil lies in the details, right? So it's basically, how does it happen? I mean, if you look at Pakistan, for example, right now, uh, there's a lot of investment in our NDCs, so the national uh, determined contributions, mm -hmm. which every country has made in terms of their commitment to reduce emissions. Pakistan has committed to around 60% of renewable energy transition by 2030. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, if you look at that number itself, it's quite an ambitious target. But practically, if you look at the context of Pakistan, we are, uh, I mean, as we know, energy is a massive issue for us. Uh, we are constrained by the, the fossil fuel that we rely on to generate power in our sector. True. Now we're investing heavily uh, on coal power plants as well. Yes. In third and other areas, right? So coal will become a cheaper source of energy that we do need to grow our economy and feed the growing population and generate jobs and all of it. But in the broader context, we're kind of going against that energy transition that we've, that we've committed. So it's a very difficult line mm -hmm. to tread mm -hmm. because on one side you do want to transition towards renewable energy but on the practical side of it the options you have which are cheaper are coal yes and if you invest in expensive energy right. options then you know the consumer in general will obviously have a huge hue and cry about the energy prices Right. And then it comes down to uh, and the, it's the a billion industry. dollar industry. I mean, the, the capitalist aspect of it's very difficult to de seed them because obviously money is involved in that and the economies are running because of, um, uh, I mean, the, the fuel and whatnot. So let's talk about your particularly your organization, how it is contributing towards more climate sustainable uh, Pakistan when we talk about it. And there's lots of conversations regarding the climate change nowadays. So please go ahead, tell us about your so organization. So the, the organization was established uh, a few years ago and was primarily established when, uh, when a consulting company uh, based in UK did a pro bono, a free piece of project for government of Pakistan on climate finance. And the problem we're trying to solve is how can we mobilize more finance for the country? 
And one of the insights that came out of that piece of work was that if there is an entity that is able to establish large scale programs, system level programs, and then they can engage global organizations to yep. mobilize capital on those pro projects and programs, that can really move the needle. And that led to the birth of, uh, of our organization as a non-profit okay. and a charity. Uh, go on, Shadad, you have a yeah, I think so you know, so, so Because, you know, I've done my research on yes. this as well. I, be, I, I believe that it was because of this German company who actually landed you a contract and three months later, you know, you, f you figured it out that they do not have more money to spend on you guys and then there you were with Pakistan Environment Trust. I would like to move on to Hassan as well. So, Hassan, obviously people now, you know, the audiences who've been with us, you know, right from the beginning of the program might have a better understanding of what, uh, you know, COP is for. So, but I, what I personally believe as an audience or probably as somebody who takes responsibility for Pakistanis sitting on this channel is that it's more of talk and less of action. And this is yes. exactly something which uh, Pakistan certainly won't like to take home because of the $40 billion losses that we have uh, seen in terms of infrastructure just last year. Mm -hmm. How do you think, you know, if you are to talk about efficiency and efficacy of the COP taking place will be for Pakistan? Do you think that there's any fruit which we are going to bear out of COP? Uh, thank you, um, Shazad and Ajra, for the opportunity to come here. I think uh, it's, uh, it's great that we are covering exactly. this topic as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the important thing to understand is that, that COP is an important platform, mm -hmm. globally speaking, when you know, your voices can be amplified because all the you know, voices in the world as well as eyes of the world are turned towards this event in terms of taking your, uh, your narrative and your vision to that global audience. It is important from a policy-making perspective. It is important from creating that impetus, that pressure, on global audiences and on global governments, especially the sort of the you know the developed West, yep. to start taking action. I think last year was a was a watershed moment in terms of putting that pressure mm -hmm. to create this loss and damage facility, this hundred billion loss and damage facility, which is now hopefully going to translate into some action. Uh, having said that, you know while it is important to create that pressure and to you know bring issues such as what Pakistan has faced to light. I think it's, it's more important for you know, audiences such as you know, in the private sector as well as other entities in the civil society to focus beyond the work that needs to go around that COP as well okay. as before that as well. Because COP is important from a policy and from a governmental perspective and a narrative building perspective. But the groundwork that needs to happen, ha needs to happen you know, the year round and decade long. I think Pakistan specifically in the past has done great work. As you pointed out, Recharge Pakistan and Living Indus are great initiatives, mm -hmm. particularly Recharge Pakistan, which has been able to mobilize climate finance <coughs> up, up, up about $70 million. Mm -hmm. But it all, it's all important to understand that it took seven years to develop that project. It took time. Yes. And I think that is what an organization like ours is focusing on right now, is actually to develop opportunities to develop projects that can mobilize finance into Pakistan. So, so does that actually mean that, you know, that, you know, for all of these years that we've been attending co and, you know, our representatives have been there, but yes. they certainly didn't come up with any program which could have benefited Pakistan or that for whatever loss and damage fund was out there that we were unable because of the fact that we didn't have any programs which were in compliance of the 2030 target or the 2050 target. I think so. To, so there are two aspects to this. Like as Hajra pointed out, I think there is, globally speaking, you know, it is, it is great to make commitments, but it is very difficult to get uh, actually mobilization on those commitments as True. well. I think the loss and damage fund is not the first example of global commitments being made. We have had commitments being made at the 2015 Paris Agreement as well. Behind that, we had commitments being made in 2001 as well, where you know m money was supposed to mobilize. So, th when the money is not being mobilized, it's not just about you know us not having those initiatives, but it's also the people, the developed West, which yeah. is you know ha had made those commitments, also mobilizing that money. Having said that, I think what we are as PET doing right now is actually you know, even if that money is mobilized or not, what we are doing is right now getting Pakistan ready to be able to take advantage of those opportunities, yeah. right? So right now we've built uh, the renewable energy certificates market, which will help mobilize money for the energy transition, which you were just alluding yeah. to. Right now it's, it's in the nascent stage, but it has those important metrics that will help mobilize. Similarly, we are talking about building, you know, carbon offsetting projects, which is an important opportunity to mobilize money for building more na na nature-based solutions to build more infrastructure on the forestry initiatives which we've already done, but actually allow us 
to tap into global financing sources uh, to be able to do right. that. Right. So. And, and when we talk about the climate financing and the climate action, uh, Hassan, let's come back to you. Sorry, come back to you. Um, so in Pakistan, the countries like Pakistan, which are reverting again and again to the IMF or to the World Bank, and these are the structures that were created after the World War II, and they reflect the realities of the World War II. And I would say that they do not reflect the realities of the climate change environment that we are operating in right now, right? And IMF has also asked Pakistan to incorporate more climate sustainable uh, actions in, in their you know, reforms and whatever we are taking about. So don't you think that it's high time we talk about restructuring the IMF and the World Bank that should reflect the realities of the climate change because um, their conditions, especially the austerity mayas that they talk about, uh, third world countries like Pakistan cannot sustain them because we need to take care of our underprivileged and considering the fact that we are adversely impacted by the climate change. And we are not even a major contributor. Obviously, yes. So it's really interesting, right? And I'm going to make, I'm not going to say a controversial point, but slightly debatable point, <laughs> because I completely agree with you, restructuring IMF yeah. yes. and sort of uh, pushing the West and all of this is great. I mean, it sounds really exciting, right, <laughs> to do all of that. But I think at, the end, the, day, go, yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, I mean, we have to realize the strength we have True. as a nation or in general, developing countries have as well. I'll give you very, one very practical example. Mm. If you go back to the flood times, uh, and it was a disaster, I mean, True. it was a disastrous time for Pakistan, so much, uh, so many lives were destroyed. So much livelihood was was ruined. There was one video. Remember, there was a video of uh, water flooding through. I think it was Sabat. Yeah, and yeah. There was the a hotel, hotel literally on the edge. That hotel yeah. collapsed. And he right? made the same hotel in the same place every so time. So I think there there is an argument to be made about how can we get the finance and what do we need to do about it. And it's a valid argument. Yeah. But I think we really need to get our house in order as well, right? True. I think it's really important for us to get our house in order. Now, I'm going to give you a very practical example. No, no, but, but, uh, yeah, oh, go ahead. Go no, ahead. But, no, go ahead. Okay. No, all I wanted to say was that, okay, you know, if you want our house to be in order, how would you like it to be? Yes, so I think there are, there are a few specific dimensions to it. There's a policy dimension to it. There's a dimension around our uh, sort of uh, talent and, and the roles that different entities play. Okay. So if you talk about the policy dimension, right, we, uh, I mean, mo uh, I've been in Pakistan for almost two years now since I moved back on this PET yeah. project. Over the past two years, I've had a lot of conversations and events and everything where the discussion is we are policy may kar dein, we make this policy, that policy. There's a lot of policy that exists in a lot of shelves in all of the government offices and we're sitting in Islamabad and I'm pretty sure if we collect all the policy documents from all the ministries, the whole constitution avenue Just will like be filled with policy. like us being over legislated as well. Yes, but the, the important thing is are these policies getting enforced or mm. implemented, right? Mm. That's where yep. the things don't happen. So I think that's one thing. On the talent side... Right, but, but when there is a barrage of water, I mean, coming inside your country and that is not of your making, so I think that tilts the debate on the... the, the I think the responsibility on the global West to do something about absolutely it, right? Absolutely agree. Yes. I absolutely agree with that. Yes. But then the West says... If, so let's just play a game, yes. right? Yeah. Mm. I am a Western country mm. and I say, oh God, I'm so... I empathize with you guys. Actually, mm. you become so the Western country. So you don't empathize <laughs> with me <laughs> at all. <laughs> so I say, ki, yaar, listen, I, I understand what you're saying. Okay, I'm going to commit. Do you? <laughs> where do you where, which project should I give money to? Hmm. Do you have yeah. a project in place? If you have a project hmm. in place, like Recharge Pakistan is a great example, hmm. right? There's a project in place, they worked on that project and they tapped into that small pot of money. It's a very small, tiny bit, mm -hmm. but it needs to scale up. Mm -hmm. To scale up that kind of money and take it to that scale, mm -hmm. specific projects, more than projects, what is needed is the role that the government plays in terms of creating those reforms. Mm. Exactly. The government did an amazing piece with loss and damage fund. I mean, that is an amazing piece mm -hmm. of work on getting access to or creating that mm. narrative. Or living in this, right? Or living in this, but, mm. but loss and damage fund specifically from a COP perspective. Mm -hmm. Now the next step is, and now we're in, the, in this COP, we're gonna try to figure out the mechanics of it, where would the fund lie, how the money the implementation mechanism when it comes to the point where the money is committed mm -hmm. and say the money is in the bank account and all the mechanics are solved mm -hmm. then come would come the real projects and then we'll be sitting ducks because are there projects that we've got defined in the way we can tap into that so business? let's talk about that because <coughs> we do have your program director over here you're <laughs> yes. a part, your, your partner at work so let's move on to him you know so what sort of projects do you think will be very feasible for Pakistan to get that climate finance or loss and damage funds that we are talking about or referring to as well. You know, so the policy bit of it, we might have, you know, kind of so many policies which, you know, Talaba is actually referred to as well, that, but there's no m implementation. And how do you think that the projects, because for now, I, it looks like as if pa Pakistan Environment Trust is going to be that bridge in between Pakistan government and, you know, for all of those countries who will be financing Pakistan for the climate change fund as well. You know, so how do you think that, you know, what projects can actually help Pakistan? I think so. Th thank you for, for that question. I think it's a very relevant point. And that is exactly what we have been working on since our inception as well. 
Um, so, you know, to create projects that are basically bankable, right? And what that really means is that, you know, I can give you a very practical example. Uh, so globally, there's this uh, mechanism called carbon markets and carbon financing, mm -hmm. wherein money is available for countries and for projects specifically, uh, especially in developing countries, which are reducing emissions uh, within that sure. context. And so Pakistan uh, absolutely has not been one of the key beneficiaries of that particular mechanism, primarily because we did not have enough projects available to be able to tap into that market, True. right? Over the past couple of years, we've seen a major project come in into that market uh, from, from Sindh as well. But right now, n not enough you know, volume or pipeline of projects is available. And that is what we are trying to do right now. So to give you an example. I'm very sorry, I'll have yeah. to pause you over here because of the mic. You know, so I think it's deteriorating. So if you can complete what he was trying to yeah, say. I think I it's think building on what Hassan is saying, right? I think what, what Hassan and the team are doing right now is, for example, on large scale forestation. I mean, we know about the 10 billion tree tsunami program exactly. that, that started in the, in the last government. I mean, this, is, this was a quite an ambitious initiative. It got us a lot of traction. Uh, the bit that was left at this point as well was how do we monetize that project and translate it into monetary numbers, not just emission reduction. Because more than emission reduction, to your mm -hmm. point, we're not even contributing that many emissions, right? So 0.05% or something? Exactly. Some, somewhere yeah, around yeah. that. Even less than that, to 0 .0 be honest. 0.01%. 0.01%, uh, right? So we need to mobilize money. So the way to monetize that was either for debt nature swaps. Mm -hmm. So we say, listen, I mean, we've put in such a huge amount of sort of trees mm -hmm. and they're reducing this much emissions. Equal to that emission, we can price the emissions and swap that with our, with our debt. Mm -hmm. Or we tap into the carbon markets that Hassan is talking about in which you get private investors to come in. Companies like, I mean, BP. And they uh, pay you for that, right? They pay you for that, right? And the, right now, the, the rate is around $23 per ton of emissions at this point. It's growing at 7% per year. Yeah. So that market, I mean, on some conservative assumption, is somewhere around more than 200 million to 500 million dollar market. Wow. For Pakistan, if we can tap into that carbon market. And, and do you think that we will be able to tap onto that carbon we market? We can absolutely tap into that. Because I think if you need to, do, you just need to have projects that get developed in the right way, which basically means the feasibilities are done, people know what is going to happen at what point in time, yeah. the financial structure is developed, the policy is there to support you. We can absolutely tap into that. And, and one other project which I would like to talk about over here while I was researching and, uh, you know, kind of learning about what right. you've been doing is, you know, there was this project you guys were talking about on a podcast and you spoke about 65,000 farmers being on that project and whatnot and, you know, it was all about the supply chain. So can you can you please elaborate on that so people have a better understanding of so what sort of projects are we talking about yeah. over here? So there's, uh, so I'm going to make two points. Sure. Uh, I'll talk about the project and I'll give you the macro picture and how we're approaching that as well. On the project side, it's uh, one, of the, one of the projects we're doing is a national biomass supply chain. So one of the problems we have is smog in Lahore that happens in every winter. Mm -hmm. a, a part and of it's that, there, it's not going anywhere. It's I not just going went anywhere. to Lahore, it's not going anywhere. It's a I, bit season technically, yeah. I'm scared of going to Lahore in winter anyway because... Mm -hmm. It was horrible, you know, imagine I was there to host and I couldn't really speak. So mm -hmm. that's the challenge, right? So I think it's important for the sustainability of the show as well. <laughs> this what happens, True. right? And so, I mean, the, the us project, ke andar, what we're trying to do is we're basically... Uh, we are working with farmers to formalize the supply chain. So all the agri waste that gets produced from wheat crops, cotton crops, rice crops, that can be sent to manufacturing factories and they can use that to produce thermal energy that they, that they need for their, uh, their operations. Okay. And that is a real opportunity that anybody can tap into. Now the challenge is this is a supply chain project, so not one company can do it. You need to have someone in the middle to do all of that work. Uh, but just building on that, to give a macro lens, right? The way we're approaching this problem is on two pillars. Mm -hmm. One is on industrial decarbonization. And that kind of goes harder to the point as well that you made, which is a really interesting point. That our emissions aren't that, uh, level, uh, yeah. that high level that, you know, it really matters. We're just vulnerable to the emissions of the rest of the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. But there is another side to it which is really important. Even though our emissions are not high, when the world is making these net zero commitments that they're going to reduce their emissions, mm -hmm. One of the things that is happening is in Europe and the US, they're bringing in carbon taxes. Mm. So if you're sending textile products mm. to Europe mm. and your textile products were made using energy from coal or fossil fuel, Ooh. if your product was mm. is being sold to Europe at like $5 mm. or $3 or mm. whatever, mm. they're going to add a tax on top because your product was made with higher emissions and then your product will but become uncompetitive. That's okay. a very unfair practice that I would suggest because coming from a third world country, coming from the underdeveloped or developing country, uh, I, th I don't think so that we have contributed towards the industrialization as much as the West has did, right? Exactly. And then putting lots of tax on our products going there because they were made from the coal uh, and making sure that they are not competitive in the market is the form of the nationalism that is reaping up inside the yeah. Europe, mm -hmm. right? And that's a, a sort of one of the 
manifestation of I the far that. right yeah. that is, is propping up across yeah. the Europe, right? It's just utilizing yes. it against, you know, the, yes. the odd ones, you yes. know. So yes. imagine just, Punjabi, just, we would say, mada mada hi rahe And just, just <laughs> tapping into the climate change narrative that, you know, because of the climate change, we are doing that, that that's a very unfair practice. And I think we need to highlight that. But again, there's lots of politics that is going inside this climate yes. change yep. narrative. Do you think that we will be able to ever bridge uh, all of this politics and uh, come back on one platform that we have to save this planet Earth and work for the humanity. So two thoughts, right? Mm. One, I completely agree with what you're saying. Mm. And there is, an, there is another way to approach this, mm. which is look at the opportunity in there. Mm. For example, if we're able to mm. show that we're taking initiatives mm. uh, towards reducing emissions, that can really put us up front of other markets. Right. For example, one of the initiatives that, that we've been privileged to drive is called Net Zero Pakistan, mm -hmm. in which we've been able to get more than 20 companies, textile companies, okay. together to make a net zero commitment. Mm -hmm. And then getting these companies together to measure their emissions and sort of drive projects that reduce these emissions. Yep. This is the first uh, net zero coalition mm -hmm. in all of the global south. Mm -hmm. And it's also the first net zero coalition in all of the textile manufacturer world as well. It's getting world a lot over. Of across the globe. No, but okay. don't you think that there's a bit of friction in between the developed and the developing countries? No, no, but that, keeping that friction aside, okay. but as an initiative showing that there is a developing country mm. that has taken this initiative to make a net zero commitment and mm. they're trying to reduce their emissions and they've come together to collaborate as well, mm. actually shows a really positive intent exactly. with the fashion brands, right? Ex and that gives us an edge. So I'll go on. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So, so, so moving on and coming back towards COP28, which will be taking place from 30th November till uh, 12th of December in Dubai, mm. you know, so two questions, Hassan Bhai, and that is what is the agenda this year for Pakistan and what is PET doing at COP? What are they doing for climate change in general towards the end? Great. Thanks, Siddharth. So I think uh, from Pakistan's perspective, the key uh, narrative now is to drive the loss and damage, uh, damage fund that Pakistan championed at the last COP and to now go towards operationalizing it, right? Mm -hmm. Right now, figuring out where it will be housed, what will be the disbursement mechanism, because primarily what is now being decided upon is, you know, how and which countries will be prioritized. Will it be sort of some of the smaller island nations that are the most affected or how, what will be the ranking in terms of prioritization? I think apart from that, there is also the climate financing narrative that is now being driven beyond the loss and damage fund. Some of the mechanisms that we talked about, such as carbon markets, etc., these will be discussed. And eventually, the, the most important aspect is also the global stock take. Because right now, what we haven't done at a collective level, and that needs to be done, that since 2015, uh, at, the la uh, at the Paris COP, you know, there was a, an agreement that in 2020, uh, the 28th COP, we will come down and sit together and see what progress we've made. Because yes. 2030 is that timeline we decided. So now that so is the So by 2030, the they said that truth. we have to reduce 50% of the emissions. Where are we on this? We, we, we are not uh, anywhere anyway? in terms of making okay. that progress. So that is, this is why it's an important... Not just us, I think... Globally speaking, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So it's an important sort of, you know, face the truth moment right now in 2023 when, you know, the figures will come to light and how far we have come and how far we still have to go. Okay. And which is where this climate financing narrative comes in important. And what will PET be doing at COPs? So PET's perspective, so we have been going to the past two COPs and, you know, participating in some of the discussions we've had. Right now, our focus as an uh, entity that is trying to drive climate finance towards bankable project opportunities, our emphasis right now is connecting with not just the policy and the governmental stakeholders, but actually with private organizations that are actively investing in climate finance projects globally. So right now, some of the projects that Tala talked about, those are what we will be taking to COP, having discussions on the side, because I think it's an important event wherein entities across the spectrum, governments, private financial institutions, NGOs, civil society activists are there. So for us, it's a very targeted opportunity to speak to some of those stakeholders that are gathered there. It's wonderful and we would want to wish you best of luck as well with the promise that, you know, as soon as you return from the COP28, you will again be here to let our viewers know whether what happened. Is that yes. a promise? Inshallah. Inshallah. So thank you so much, uh, Talabai, so for being with us. Lovely to be thank in conversation so with you and for everybody who's out there. We're actually heading out towards a short break. But once we guys will come back, for example, unfortunately, if you are unable to mitigate you know, for whatever is disturbing and Pakistan is more vulnerable, unfortunately, we are pushing ourselves towards a disaster. Do we really need to be prepared for a disaster? If yes, how do we prepare for a disaster or our future generations? Unfortunately, if that's what we are looking at. Right after a short break, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Modi regime is pursuing policies in occupied Jammu and Kashmir to create more hardships for Kashmiris. Indian authorities have deliberately created worst power crisis in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Electricity generated in occupied Jammu and Kashmir is transmitted to Indian states while Kashmiris are facing worst power outage. This is worst example of exploitation of natural resources of Kashmir by Modi regime. Modi regime is using these tactics to punish the Kashmiris for their demand of right to self-determination. Islamabad Capital Territory, a modern planned city that is well maintained and well organized. Islamabad is Pakistan's clean, calm and green capital. Founded in the 1960s, it attracts people from all over Pakistan. Located on the Potohar Plateau in the northeastern part of the country, between Rawalpindi District and the Margala Hills National Park to the north, Faisal Mosque, the largest mosque in South Asia, Margla Hills National Park, Dhamaniko, Pakistan Monument, Rawal Lake, Simli Lake, and Fatima Jinnah Park are among the tourist attractions in the territory. It is ranked as the second most beautiful capital city in the world. Welcome back and before going on to the break, Shahzad Lura to the fact we were discussing about the climate change that what happens when disaster strikes in and it's very important to have the sort of the life skill imparted towards our children in such sort of environment and how to, uh, I mean, they respond to such sort of situation in which there is a disaster. So without any further ado and without monopolizing our conversation, we would like to introduce our guest for the second segment who is going to uh, talk about the life skills and what is exactly a disaster education. So we are very glad that we have been joined by Eman Shahid. She's a public speaker, educationist and sustainability enthusiast. Assalamu alaikum Eman and thank you so much for coming to our show. Assalamu and thank you for inviting me. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Wonderful to have you over here and for the very first time that we are listening that you know that our future generations really yeah. needs to be educated about sustainability, mm. not just that disaster management. I believe that it's a, it's a wonderful idea. But well, first of all, we would like you to explain it to our viewers whether what it is that we are talking about today. Yes. Uh, so just like a few minutes before, we were talking about lifestyle changes and how can uh, we need to do it at mass level. A conversation is one thing, uh, but the implementation is one thing. So from practice, uh, policies to practices is the transition I would rather be focusing on. Right. I would not be taking the policy part. That can mm -hmm. the, uh, the other management can take in. I would be uh, working on the ground level, from not from the top uh, towards the bottom approach, from the bottom towards the top approach. That would be my focus. And I think uh, for that, education is the mass section where we can work on. Okay, sure. Uh, because that's where w every policymaker grows from. Mm -hmm. So if then from we will start from early levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, this would be a little... Uh, uh, and, and before we get started, yeah. very sorry, but since you happen to be a vice principal of a local school over here as well, yeah. why do you think there was a need to for you to come up with such a program? Yes, so recently as you know that uh, Pakistan also um, had passed through an unfortunate uh, event.
event of disaster True. and then because I work in a school which is a two nation school and the other nation is Turkey and Turkey itself passed through a natural True. disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, we felt that the mass destruction could have been uh, reduced in case we were more prepared which is called right. disaster preparedness or management right. uh, and that especially for the children as well it could and can definitely be a natural disaster however it can also be man-made conflicts as well mm -hmm. where the students uh, the children needs to be prepared for it True. and you know they are the most sensitive part of it because at times in the chaotic conditions uh, the adults can take care uh, they are also in obviously True. chaos but the students and the children need to be more emphasized on they need to be more prepared they are the mm -hmm. least prepared mm -hmm. uh, in such a so, so let's but get started with it so how yeah. we try trying to educate them because yes. you know when when I think about my kids when I think about my daughters you know mm -hmm. I certainly do not want to come up with a word which you know, kind of rings a bell, you know, probably an alarm bell in my mind, you know, when I use the word disaster, right? Yes. So is it like, you know, we, 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 we are more c careful with our vocabulary, but we're teaching them or giving them skills to save their life by their own selves, mm. unfortunately, if they are in a situation like that. And mm. I think that is an essential part of the training, especially in the France and in the Western countries, yes. because they do have the practical training, the alarm bells goes on and they have to evacuate the buildings mm. and we don't have that practice in Pakistan. Mm. So I think we can emulate that. I had it in my school though, you know, I studied yeah, it very drills well. Are and, uh, uh, common schools. practice. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> drills are definitely the basic base uh, step that every school and we do it as well in our level. However, we want to go beyond that. Okay. Uh, we believe that a curriculum, and our school curriculums True. need to be revised in a ways, uh, not like um, normalizing it. It's becoming a taboo of certain topics and disaster is also becoming that we should not be talk about. It's definitely because it disturbs us because we don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. It disturbs us more about True. it. True. So in, in case we normalize our conversations about it, it would be better for the students and for the children as as well to be prepared. Mm -hmm. So curriculum emphasis, curriculum reviews in terms of public and private sectors, both mm -hmm. would, and, and I think it's very convenient for both of the sectors in their own domains. Uh, now we have a new stream of education in Pakistan as well, which is called an IB stream. Um, so IB is it international allow, baccalaureate. Yes, yeah. international baccalaureate. And it allows you to make your own curriculum. So that gives you the privilege that mm -hmm. you can definitely design your curriculum on uh, the disaster management as well. In case of public and private, we can definitely have a standalone curriculum curriculum for both. Uh, for the public, the one or two inculcation of that it can be revised like or every year they are revising the curriculum of the public schools. Well, for the kind of curriculum which is available now, you know, on yes. sustain, uh, sustainability mm -hmm. and disaster management, you know, what are we trying to teach kids, you know, for whatever, because we are very unaware of, you know, such a curriculum, it's yes. for the very first time that we are hearing about it. Uh -huh. So why don't you, you know, take us through that, okay, this is what we're teaching kids these days. We are definitely teaching a baseline. We're taking, talking about plantation, about environment, about pollution, right. something like that, which is on a baseline. However, again, it's just the conversation and it's not the practical mm -hmm. implementation. Yep. So why we not proportionate that w this type of a curriculum, like in any subject area, this percentage of the curriculum we are talking about, our school calendars should have particular mm -hmm. activities regardless of, uh, regarding uh, mm -hmm. disasters and regarding sustainability mm -hmm. and not just that that uh, we need to talk more about writing skills, about uh, students encouraging students to have podcasts on that. Raising their own voices. Raising their uh, voice and choice is yeah. what they should be starting from the initial stages. They right. should not just be aware of it, they should be acknowledging it and they should be voicing it and choice, choosing the life skills as well accordingly mm -hmm. as well. Right yes. and I think that fits a lot in the climate change narrative and especially there's a lots of discourses and conversation regarding the climate change but uh, you but now let's talk about the intersection of the disaster education and the use of artificial yes, intelligence yes. into the education because mm -hmm. it is a big big part of that right uh -huh. um, and how it is changing and reshaping a lot of events around the world so please your expertise. Um, artificial intelligence something of a very interesting topic and I think that has becoming for educationists I don't know about uh, the, uh, the corporate sector but for education it came as a phobia it came as a like yes, oh yes, my god nightmare. what is happening oh here it's a, it was a nightmare actually sure. uh, because we were unable to deal with it. Uh, as an educator as well. So I think um, now um, if we look at it, we should not be afraid of it. Rather, we should use it as a tool mm -hmm. to um, improvise what we are trying to do. And it can be a great help. Mm -hmm. uh, this actually, this fear or the nightmare comes because we are not actually prepared for it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not explored artificial intelligence in a way that mm -hmm. how can it facilitate us in our teaching and in learning process. Right. So um, this I would definitely encourage because of the augmented reality, mm -hmm. uh, the which 
virtual reality the students uh, of course we can have simulations of the students preparing like going through the simulations of how if in case a disaster struck or the war struck or a conflict struck mm -hmm. how can would you like to because it gives you the chance of trial methods yeah. so okay now uh, we cannot do this, do this we can do that. do that let's try this another method yeah. if we go yeah it's more like a game and, method. and it's better as well so imagine yes. that you know as much as you know we you know I don't know whether you know people are, have started to rely on artificial intelligence or augmented reality, but it certainly can help and you know can share the outcomes of what can possibly go wrong. Unfortunately, if you take a wrong step. Yes. Now I would like to know, you know, as a vice principal, how do you see kids responding to it? You know, are are kids very keen to kind of learn about it, or are they like, you know, why, do, madam, why do we have to go through it? You know, uh -huh. you know, so there might be multiple the questions from kids' would, perspective, yes, right? Yes, the first step would come how the teachers react to that because obviously the staff has to be trained, not just the staff, the all the staff has to be trained uh, in a way. The first step is always the teacher training that we do. And then it comes to uh, conquering that uh, to the student level. Mm -hmm. um, no, do, do they don't, uh, unfortunately, because now be there's a lot of conversation about climate change as mm -hmm. well. Uh, they have witnessed the climate change uh, actions. And now, because I told you that we already have started off with the climate change SDGs are there uh, the stu uh, student sustainable development goals have been implemented in the schools as well yep. and at the not like um, at the mass level but at least at the basic level we do try to do it and inculcate our integrate our understanding so, of uh, so, so can subjects. you can you share a few questions which kids do usually ask most very very commonly you know very often of course, I mean, they do ask that if it is a natural disaster, the, how can the human made impact be there? Okay. Because obviously, you cannot predict an earthquake. Uh, even the technology has failed so to predict. It's a very smart question. What's yeah. the answer to this? <laughs> it is about not predicting, it is about being prepared. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and that's something that we've al always spoken about as well. But Hajanu, you, you know, I would want to come down to a point where. You know, she spoke about how you can have your own curriculum. You know, I, I think it's brilliant because if it, if my teacher came up to me and was like, "Bete, okay, you know, you tell me what do you want to study," I'll be like, "I don't want to study at all." You know, yeah. that'll be my curriculum. Right. But not just that. I think that while we were growing up, we weren't given any choice. Yeah. You know, because you spoke about voice and Honestly, choice. Yes. I think that's something which I would love to talk about. You know, either it was the mother's way or the highway, you know, or the parents' way or the highway, you know, yes. so they were like, beta, tum na batao hume, to hum tumhare ammi abbu hote hain, to hum tumhye batayenge. Because the learning styles over the years have changed. We were the auditory learners mm -hmm. and now the students, uh, the, uh, the children have become more of a visual learner or kinesthetic learners. Mm -hmm. They want to do things. So, uh, or they want to do it in a multi way, multi sensory way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that is why it is better that they start with the ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the transfer transformation of the paradigms in education is that it should be transformed from a, 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 a fixed or robust curriculum towards a curriculum where the students take initiatives and the students take ownership of their own learning. Mm -hmm. It's not that the teachers are telling about a particular curriculum, it's coming from the students and taking ahead from that. So uh, I think that uh, that will go from there, that uh, the giving that ownership to the students will definitely be impacting at the mass level. Right. Uh, the, the government is definitely focusing on the policies and the finances is one factor that you already have talked about I was uh, in a few minutes before. Uh, how can you mobilize and how can you do that? So um, uh, that is definitely important, but it is also a very rigorous process and it's a time taking process again sure. that you were discussing right now. Sure. And it does take time to implement and see <laughs> the results of that. So I rather focus on initiating from the early stages that we already are doing. It's actually combining the efforts of education and uh, the climate uh, advocates. Exactly. Just like that. And, and it's nice. I think that you know, all of these initiatives uh, are taken, first of all, to consider that, alhamdulillah, that we value human life. And yes. this is something which everybody needs to understand. But you know, there's, there's one more understanding. And you know, so this example might be very vague and off the track. But mm -hmm. I would like to share. So imagine that you know, I've always been into karate and whatnot. Okay. So every time, unfortunately, I've ended up in a fight, you know, that karate has never worked for me. Huh. You know, I, so, so I forgot yes, all the yes. kicks which they taught me. Yes. So now for whatever we are trying to teach mm. those kids, yes. how, how do we gauge that, okay, you know, that, you know, right. oh, God forbid, 
under a pressure situation, they will be able to utilize that skill right. that we're imparting to them. It definitely is, a, again, I would say that because we do it as a drill and not as a process. Yeah. We do it like one-time drill that you talked about. Uh, a that we're going thing. to ring a bell and every student needs to come out of the class. Yes, it's a it's basic just like drill. That. We have been going through uh, it as well. That's more of a difference? fun activity for the kids, activity right? Activity. You know? Yes. Yeah, because the class has been disrupted and then uh, you yes. move <laughs> out and it's more of a fun. Who will go first, who will go yes. on the last and, you know, yes. so something like that. Yeah. So, uh, it is in, again, it has to be becoming a process. Um, as I said that now the climate activity have done a good job in Pakistan as well I would say that that they have started talking a lot about sustainability and SDGs mm. yep. and the, even the students know about it if you talk about MUNs the model in the debates mm. the students talk a lot about it yes. now yes. Uh, so this was gained after an efforts of couple of years so education is definitely not like giving you an answer after right. a few months it's going to give time for that mm. you need to go through that cycle again and mm. again and because it's not going to end now mm. the world is not I, I mean reversing the world to the level that we disturb is one thing yep. but preparing for worst is also another aspect exactly and how do you think other schools are responding to such a program I would definitely emphasize to this platform as well that this the schools should actually need to they're doing it individual level we mm. everybody is doing it but they need to uh, mutualize their uh, efforts as well so there should be platforms right. as well for the staff for the schools where they do come uh, I think MUN is one of those platforms definitely where all the schools is. are coming together but at um, th it's the proportionate level is low so I, I mean uh, if we want to do it if we want to have a visible results we need to speed up of our efforts as well and recently uh, I would say there was a uh, different international NGOs as well they were combining different schools in Pakistan and they were talking about life skills as well citizenship as well that we don't teach to the students yes. global citizenship we don't teach to the students Fun. not I mean mm. we do it at a particular level in the university but not starting from the school True. they don't know about the voting rights they don't know about the hierarchy of being a the responsible states person states person yes mm. so I think these should this life skills as well personal safety guardians all these things should start from the initial year my focus would be that exactly right. but right. thank you so thank much you so Emin much. for being with us it was lovely to be in conversation with so such much. a um, you know, visionary young person who happens to be a vice principal at a school and is thinking about the safety of the children who actually study uh -huh. in her school. I think it's wonderful and for everybody who's out there, I think if you know a school owner or if you know somebody in a school, this is something which really needs to go out there. We really need that preparedness as well. So please make sure that you keep an eye out and for each and every individual who's out there, you, it's your responsibility, it's my responsibility and Hajar's responsibility to make sure Absolutely. that we come out with processes which will help us get better every single day. But well, that's it for the show. But today, Absolutely. today there's something very special. That's true and uh, I totally echo what Shazad said. Yeah. But obviously it's very special because um, yesterday it was our producer's youngest daughter, Abiha Bilal's birthday. She's a very cute child. Happy birthday to you, Abiha. And may you have many more and may you grow up to be a young, Ali. responsible citizen <laughs> like we talked about. Like your mother. <laughs> you like your mother. Be like your mother. Right. She's always on time, Bia. And so be a happy birthday Day to you. you. May you, you have, have many, many more. more. And happy may you never you. be like your mom. <laughs> Thank you, Bia. Thank you, Bia. And Bia, aapko uh, saal mubarak. Thank you so much. And uh, you know, it feels nice when it's it's kids' birthday. You know, we we see them grow. They grow faster. And parents really need to make sure that you know whatever they plan for their kids. Make sure that they ask them whether they want it or not. <laughs> I, think, I think that's it. I think that nowadays they are being groomed in a very different environment. So definitely, even if they're not asking yet, kids are going to reinforce <laughs> what they want, right? Uh, so with that, we will wrap up our segment and bid you farewell and Allah Hafiz. And until next time, it's a goodbye and good, good morning. Good morning.